Hi everybody, John Meyer here again with this totally unscripted and awesome series with Jeff Barr, Corey Quinn, and Stephen Barr at Jeff's house. We're at in his office down in his studio where he just had it finished up. And this happened about two months ago, three months ago, back in March. We showed up at Jeff's house. We set up as quick as possible and we got deep ingrained in his conversation. Now I carved this conversation up into easy 15 minute digestible bites in a seven part series. We talked about all kinds of things, but in this episode, we're talking about AWS cost allocation tagging and does it accept emojis? Well, if you give it a try, good luck with your billing structure. How many driver's license does Jeff Barr have and how do you validate that data? Also, running into Jeff on the streets of San Francisco, reinvent, reinforce, pretty much anywhere I can find Jeff and it's always nice to run into a familiar face. Also, are the foundational skills for IT lacking where you have to explain what a data center is or networking? Maybe we need to go back from the start. I'm not sure, but this one's actually a really interesting topic. And what happened to the early easy to instances? How about we dive into this episode and get started? The, for better or worse, there's a lot of normalization stuff around the text characters now. Like I, I'm probably indirect responsible for at least a little bit because most sensible people don't ask questions like, what if the name of that cost allocation tag is just an emoji? What happens then? It's yeah. like, well, will the, will the billing system explode? No, because those people it? do good work. Okay. Not that I'm aware of yeah. any, more, any more so than billing systems uh, can you, can you put all those funky characters in? Tags and stuff like that? Yes. I've never tried, okay. Oh yeah, and use oh, and password, but good luck typing that password. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. What happens if you use like a right to left language? I haven't tried that yet, but only because I just never bothered. No, that's not true. I've, I have had Hebrew embedded before, and it, it works. Does it work? Okay. Yeah. It's I'm UTF. Sorry. There's a. It's, I believe it's part of the UTF-8 standard, which okay. is why it works. But yeah, just, yeah, it, like it'll almost certainly not present problem. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's a presentation mm -hmm. issue, but the character encoding should be. Mm -hmm. Like you can like it has to be that way because look at the regions you have in Korea and mainland China where there are radically different non ASCII characters. There, there's a normalization function somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, even just processing UTF-8 is a lot of work. Yeah. I, I'm so glad I'm not, like, I used, I did that a long time ago, and it's one of those things you don't want to actually claim you know anything about, because then you're like, oh, you're the local yeah, expert, nationalization yeah. expert. It's like, hey, I heard you know regular expressions. It's like, oh, well, someone oh, needs to have their, oh. to keep their mouth shut. Like, yeah. No, Ugh. international concerns, and, and they're totally valid concerns, but they're really hard. Like, oh. trying to make sure that all the text shows up the right way, and then... Making sure that it's not exploited in some way that then creates some like way that you can like break a, a system. The thing that bothered me it's really hard. even recently was I built something that winds up uh, doing some processing on the CSV export of the AWS bill, mm -hmm. and approximately half the time the Python would explode with a traceback about how like this isn't a valid date format, and it's what on earth? There was no rhyme or reason to it. It turns out that if you open a CSV in Microsoft Excel, make zero changes, and then happen to save the file, yeah. it rewrites all of your date formats. Oh, and yes. things like the account ID uh, is now expressed like in yes. uh, scientific yeah. notation. Uh, and it's, this is not good. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've had to yeah. learn to speak both languages of those it, time stamp nonsense. Kind of disappointing that as an industry, we haven't gotten, like my first job when I was like 20 something, where we were doing like data processing, mm -hmm. We had this. We were doing this research thing where we got driver's license data from a bunch of different states, and we were trying to figure out if drivers had licenses in more than one state to spread convictions around. Yeah. And this was way before the era of actual like databases and stuff like that. They still don't sync super well on the state level. And and so we always had to do a, a first pass through all the data, and for every field, we'd have to collect all the values in the field and make sure we knew what all those things actually meant, because there'd be like a field for like eye color. And there'd be all this like le legit set of enumerated values. But then there'd always be someone with like one brown eye and one green eye. Mm -hmm. And there'd be this wise old person somewhere in the back of the building who would invent some new code for that. Wouldn't show up on the official representation of like this is all, these are all the values for the field. Yeah. And so we had to always pre-pass the data and then go back to every state and say, well, we found these weird values in the field. And they're like, oh, well. That's homicide by motor vehicle, and we only had one of those, so we invented a new code for that. And oh, that means that they've got one real leg and one fake leg. And it, th this was way before databases, and it was like dealing with that kind of data was really. And we were paying for every run on the mainframe, so it was 
He it was real hard. Look at how much of machine learning and data science is really like data normalization. Yeah, it, get, get all the garbage yeah. out of it. Yeah. Uh, get all the, this was, every run would cost us hundreds of dollars on the mainframe. And so we actually got to be friends with like the operator of the mainframe who was thought the project was cool. He would let us run stuff at night on, on like the house account. And well, I was so nice guy. guy. Yeah. yeah. I was talking to a friend of mine. So this is to show you how little this has evolved. He was working with interoperability between different healthcare providers. And just as a stupid example, he said, okay, on one particular date, in one of his healthcare providers, uh, the weight shifts of all their patients because that's the date they decided to start using uh, kilograms instead of pounds. Mm. So it's not like everyone in their clinic all of a sudden lost a bunch of weight. It's that they have to know, okay, for this particular clinic, on this particular date, afterwards you convert it. It's just, there's a million of those in every kind of data interchange between these different, uh, and I guess what I learned being healthcare IT for a while is the electronic medical records, just because it's digital, <laughs> it's kind of standard yeah, quality. Totally mm -hmm. that, that's exactly it. I'm pretty sure that the data is still either, it's been hassly um, input, right? So as quick as possible, or nobody's validating the data that's available or in the database and it's just passing through. And until somebody goes, the hell is this value here? Like, and then, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't make any sense. Like new building is day one. You can define your own schema day two. Oh, no. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, usually when we were doing those driver's license data, they give us this piece of paper that was on somebody's cubicle wall that had been scratched out. And like, it was like the authoritative, that was a schema. It was like, okay, well, columns one through three of this, and then four through five of that, and then nine through 11 of that, and then like a bunch of cross outs. And, and there was always one person per state that was like the encoding specialist and we had to find and that was like the oldest crustiest person in the building and you yeah. find them and like oh yeah this is how we actually did all the data representation and you want to hope things are better now but mm. it doesn't sound that way no no they're not although the one thing that i do find uh, a little uplifting is the fact that even with my chicken scratch now some of these modern things can actually interpret it and convert it to text it's okay that that's handy like I, that's your, your handwriting? Yes. Yeah. Which is not good, Jeff. It's not good. No. Yeah. I can't read my own writing as we discussed before, so yeah, it's... that doesn't help. But... but it's not the beat up Martin gets translated to eat up Martha of the, uh, the Apple <laughs> Newton. Yeah. <laughs> like, you should be a doctor. It's like, why? Because your handwriting, my handwriting bad? No, because you think you're God. Like, no, <laughs> oh, okay, great. That doesn't work. Yeah. And we just all of a sudden heard that. So that that's why I have trouble working in situations where people are talking about stuff they know like you, you hear a, a, a buzzword and like you yeah. immediately want to know what's going on or see if you can learn something about it or contribute in some way if i go to a library or a starbucks i can work there forever even if it's the same noise level because it's stuff that i don't know what's going on around me yeah. and I'm, I'm happier with that level of of buzz i, I always find it disconcerting especially in san francisco where i live where there's a coffee shop and i'll overhear like aws keywords and i'll like go on oh, point man, like a or something it's yeah, yeah, it's like, are they complaining about like billing or service names or, oh, oh they're trying to set up networking stuff. I'm not going to complain about <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They want to set up a database. Lead them to the real Yeah, I think the last database. time I was in San Francisco, didn't you and I run into each other on the street? We we're, we're literally like we were on a corner somewhere and we like crossed paths. And... This sounds like a weird story to start, but uh, we were at the San Francisco summit and I had come down for it. And I was going with Mark Birch over to the loft that was opening up. Yeah. And we were hustling through, and there was another lady who was with us, and we were running down, and all of a sudden, you were walking down the same street, and it was just weird timing. We didn't know each other. We're in San Francisco, right on the street, doing, and it was actually like kind of perfect. And the same thing happened. Was, we were on market. Yeah. You, you were walking onto market. And I yes. Was already there. Right, right around the yeah. corner, and we were heading over to that. That was pretty cool because that was when the loft opened back up for the startups. And I did a promo video for Mark over there. We did a quick uh, tutorial of it and captured all the events. So uh, that also happened at Remars. You were up on the top by the studio that they were doing AWS. Was it AWS on here? No. Was it? You were up on one of the, the mezzanine levels and you were actually over there and they, you said that they uh, invited you down and you had no speaking session, nothing going <laughs> on. And you came down to Vegas as... Just a participant. Somebody yeah. just show up and not have... Sometimes it's good to be a civilian in these yeah, situations. Yeah. And you're, you're just there just to enjoy. I've never been to Remars and I intend to go this year. First time. 
There was some cool things. There was a uh, rap battle pods. I can't remember the name of it. I did an interview with the guys, and it was all AI driven. You would give them like uh, a couple of like top three things, and they would create a rap back and forth on the spot against the two. And I did a video on that. Uh, the I did a couple of interviews in it. They have a nice Raymar's pillow. <laughs> can't say where it's at no uh, <laughs> but that was uh, it, it's it's interesting to see some of that the Alexa home stuff that's there uh, when you walk through that you get to see all that uh, there was this little robot that it was like a worker a service one um, you could put stuff in and it, what it would do is it would follow you around like a dog but think of you think of the aspect that you're a worker and you need to carry stuff uh, I'm a photographer or I'm there doing content, I need somebody to carry my bag, you put it in there and it would follow you wherever you went. The only thing I was like, well, okay, so now it just knows what my legs look like. What if I like, put on some pants or something? <laughs> <laughs> and can't, right colored shoes, yes. that's how you saw it. Yeah, well, that, that probably would work, but I thought it was pretty cool. Like, I, I could see a lot of value and they had different sizes, like small, medium, and large. They were coming out with like a huge one for it. Uh, so the innovation there, I saw the Boston Robotics. They were uh, just watching them. I've never seen it in person. So the Astro, the uh, Amazon robot that had the, uh, the yes. copy on the website, they yes. claimed it cannot go up or downstairs. No, no, no. It cannot go up downstairs a second. <laughs> <laughs> we can what. Yeah. Yeah, you know, all these robots, like, especially the ones that are like help around the home, it, it seems kind of silly right now, but we're hitting this interesting demographic situation really quickly where there aren't enough young people to do certain kinds of jobs. Like, yeah. this isn't just a theoretical, like, oh, we're running out of people. Like, you you talk to, like, I, when I got my hair cut, my stylist, she said there, there are no, there's no, nobody in the hairstylist business in their 20s anymore because mm -hmm. all the, like, she said three of the five beauty schools in the area closed during the pandemic and it costs so much to do beauty school that it takes you, your, your first year you make no money and so as a result there are no 20 something as they said it's going to in a couple of years a haircut's always going to cost you a hundred dollars where, wherever you go because there's just no young people entering the field and we've got a similar situation here with with the washington state ferries where if you want and, and the ferries here are not just a, a leisurely fun thing to do like there's a lot of people that actually commute back and forth on ferries yeah. um a lot of the captains are reaching retirement age, but the, the dock hands that just wave you onto the boat and then help you get into the parking space and everything, you have to go through like the Marine Academy and you have to go through training and you have to go through Coast Guard certification and then you have to be kind of like a floating, because of the union apparently, yeah. you're like a floating employee, not floating in the water, you're like floating from location to location <laughs> for a while. It's uh, a floating employee. Yeah. He's a good boy. He's yeah. there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they, they don't give you a permanent full-time assignment for, yeah. I want to say, 18 months. And so there, there are no young people that are now dockhands. And so they routinely cancel ferry transits because there's not enough staff. Yeah. So when you start talking about, we were talking home automation and whatnot, and you're talking about not enough young people to do things like, oh, well, yes, they moved out. I mean, that does eventually happen at some point when kids grow <laughs> up. But I'm also seeing it in the industry we're in, where I don't know too many network engineers who are younger than I am. Mm -hmm. like, we're starting to see certain skill sets that are foundational and yes. fundamental uh -huh. not being anywhere near uh, as Several well. times I've had to explain to these young folks what a data center is. Uh, <laughs> they like they're, they're such cloud natives that the idea of a data center is like, oh, that's a weird kind of... Oh, that would be great for a museum, like a tour. It's, this yeah. is a data yeah. center tour. It's an availability <laughs> zone component. <Yeah. laughs> I like Werner Vinge's term of computational archaeologist and what, you know, what the copy, what being uh, in tech a thousand years from now will be like, where there'll be, there'll still be a Linux kernel at the bottom of the stack, mm -hmm. and then just thousands and thousands of layers and probably ten different versions of Docker on top of it. Yeah. How do you, you know, peel this all back? I was talking to the S3 team about this, and I said, look, the, if you look at S3, S3 has to exist until the end of the world, right? Like, it, it has to, right? Yeah. There, there's... It, it's, it is foundational. There is like, no exit strategy. Right, okay, so which is, which is awesome. Yeah. But that means that 500 years from now, some, some dev is gonna be going through like, you know, commits from 100 plus years ago, 200 years ago, trying to figure out what was going on and what was the design and the architecture and how does this work and how many like quintillion, gazillion objects are in here and who built this again and where did it come from? And, and the great commit message is like, work this time. Like, yeah. Like, Useful. I, the, the, this idea of like building software that's going to last for actual generations is really interesting. 
I'm still horrified to know there are small bits of infrastructure I built 10 years ago that are still in effect somewhere. It's yeah. That mm -hmm. should not be at all. Mm. On the other hand, yeah, we have what we did with the earliest EC2 instances, which didn't get a whole lot of publicity. Like James wrote about it. Yeah, um, where you want to effectively virtualize. They virtualized, and then there, there are virtual M1s and C1s and a couple of first and second generation instances. The original hardware is long gone. And right, because they, they, it required they, a double clutch and a kickstart. But yeah, yeah I, they, they built this really nice virtualization layer, and they're, they're kind of like retro instances, as I think yeah. you would think about it, and transparently move customers to them. And I, I was yeah. detecting that they could have like a sort of a virtualization layer they can migrate around, and I picked up on it about six months before it was announced because it, I, it occurred to me one day, wait a minute, I'm getting a lot fewer instance interrupt notices where this instance has gotten potentially non-responsive, mm -hmm. stop and restart it, and it just stopped happening. And uh -huh. it's like, oh, I guess I suddenly started getting lucky with my instance uh -huh. placements, but I talked to other people, and we're all getting lucky. So, so you have suspicious. better instances. Yeah, it's like, wow. it's... That's on some level it's a value proposition of cloud, where if I wind up building something in cloud and then going away for ten years, assuming mm -hmm. the payment still clears, and I come back, it will have gotten better, more durable, more yeah. cost effective. Try with a data center, by the end of year three, the raccoons have carried the rusting carcasses out of the servers out of the wilderness. <laughs> it, yeah. We have those raccoons around here. We have a lot of wildlife here in the city, believe it or not. There's raccoons I get on my security camera almost every night. And we have coyotes too on the street. Mm. So they're well, everybody, what did you think of episode number four? I mean, we're only four in and we've got three more to go. And the exciting thing is we just keep getting deeper and deeper into the conversation. In the next episode, we're talking about S3 objects and how long will they be around? Maybe we'll never know because we won't be here. Who's been paying your AWS bill after you leave? Is uh, Jeff's 2013 road trip one of his best road trips of all time getting to be known everywhere? Also, Jeff and I outlined the story of how we originally became friends. The big ask, the bold ask, and the saying yes to having just a cup of coffee. And until this day, Jeff and I became really great friends for this video, this podcast. How Jeff, Corey, and I actually all got together and started a webinar. And let me tell you what, that was nerve-wracking. And the full video production at AWS. All right, we're wrapping up this video. And stay tuned for video number five in this totally unscripted series where we talk more at Jeff's house. Stick around for it.